Na het gebruik aan deze universiteit open ik met de woorden Spiritus Sancti Gratia Illuminat Sensus et Corda Nostra. Gaat u zitten. Om te beginnen wil ik natuurlijk van harte welkom heten professor Korsten, die zo haar oratie zal houden. Maar ook hartelijk welkom aan allen die ons hier verblijden met uw aanwezigheid. U bent in grote getalen gekomen, dat verheugt mij zeer. Iets over professor Korsten. Die heeft haar bachelor gedaan aan de Hogeschool Zeeland in de aquatische ecotechnologie. Uh, en daarna een masters in, uh, bij Wageningen Universiteit en die heeft ze cum laude gehaald. En uh, toen had ze de smaak te pakken, want daarna is professor Korsten uh, uh, gepromoveerd, ook in Wageningen, op het proefschrift Aquatic Ecosystems in Hot Water. Uh, misschien uh, is er iets uh, herkenbaar. Uh, effects of Climate on functions, Functioning of Shallow Lakes. Misschien komt dat nog terug. Uh, en dat was ook cum laude. Dus uh, ja, heel, heel erg goed. Uh, daarna een periode van, uh, van bijna tien jaar uh, postdocs bij verschillende instellingen. Wageningen, Leibniz Instituut voor Freshwater Ecology en Inland Fisheries. Uh, Wageningen weer, uh, KNW Instituut voor uh, uh, Ecologie. Um, en daarna naar onze universiteit gekomen in 2013. In eerste instantie als UD, uh, tegenwoordig ook assistant professor geheten. En in... Uh, 2021 gepromoveerd tot UHD, Associate Professor. En sinds 1 mei, als, uh, sinds 1 mei vorig jaar, als, uh, als full professor, dus als uh, volledig hoogleraar. Um, professor Korsten uh, speelt ook een belangrijke rol in het, uh, uh, nou, zeggen, het vormgeven van uh, uh, de zaken binnen het instituut voor uh, biologie en uh, ecologische studies. Um, zij is uh, uh, eerst een tijdje uh, waarnemend hoofd geweest van, uh, van de, de, haar afdeling en daarna uh, inderdaad hoofd geworden. Uh, maar is nu ook het, uh, het hoofd van het cluster ecologie binnen Ribes, het, uh, het onderzoeksinstituut. Um, professor Korsten heeft al een heel uh, groot aantal bachelor, master studenten en promovendi begeleid. Dat is uh, werkelijk... Uh, uh, een groot aantal. Um, en veel uh, subsidies gekregen. En ook een enorme internationale impact, bijvoorbeeld door haar bijdrage aan uh, het IPCC-rapport in 2019. So this was my uh, introduction in, in Dutch. Um, I, I hope that uh, most of you would, be, uh, would have been able to follow it. The rest of the ceremony will be in English. And uh, I now give the floor to Professor Kosten to Tell us about aquatic ecosystems in hotter water. Thank you very much. And first, thank you all for being here, either in the aula or online. I know a lot of people are also participating there. Dank jullie wel voor uh, het aanwezig zijn hier in de aula of, en ook online. Het uh, betekent heel veel voor mij. Ik vind het heel leuk om nu te kunnen vertellen, vooral aan de mensen die dat niet zo goed weten, wat ik eigenlijk doe um, in mijn werk. Um, de, um, mijn reden zal in het Engels zijn, maar in het Nederlands staat alles op de tekst. Dus ik hoop dat iedereen het goed kan volgen. So, let's start. In 2010, I defended my PhD thesis entitled Aquatic Ecosystems in Hot Water. I studied the impact of climate and climate change on everything that you could find in a shallow lake. So plants and animals and also microorganisms. It is very clear that our lakes are warming up. Our Dutch water systems, for example, are already three degrees warmer than, let's say, 100 years ago. And this is far warmer than the pledge that we made with a lot of countries around the world in the Paris Agreement to try to minimize the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees or two maximum. And our waters are warming up very quickly. So it's going much faster than anticipated. And this has big impacts on the plants and animals that we find uh, in these waters. So hence the title. 
back then when I defended my thesis, the, um, um, our ecosystems were really in hot water, which also means being in trouble. Here we see the percentage of surface waters back in those days that was in a bad ecological condition. Most of that was due to the fact that a lot of nutrients from our agro industry was coming into our water systems. As you can see here, the Netherlands is not doing well. Red is bad. Also, the countries surrounding our country are doing very bad. So this was back then. When we look at the recent update, the color scheme changed, but it's still not much better, if any better at all. Um, we are still doing very bad when it comes to the ecological quality of our waters. And that was the, um, the reason, the inspiration of the title of my talk today, Aquatic Ecosystems in Even Hotter Water. Um, there are still a lot of problems, a, lot of, a whole spectrum of different um, problems play a role. We still have a very high nutrient loading of phosphorus and nitrogen from our agro-industry coming into our surface waters, but also residues from medicines and, um, and pesticides, for instance, that end up in our water systems. So there is a whole range of stressors, and this combined with climate change effects such as warming, but also drought, and um, 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 extreme temperatures really have a strong effect on aquatic ecosystems. So what I am interested in is how different of these stressors that I just mentioned, how they impact um, the lakes and the rivers and the ditches and all kinds of water systems that surround us. And equally so, I'm also interested in trying to find out ways how we can minimize the negative impacts of these, um, of, of these different stressors. I think most of you kind of know that there is a lot of uh, issues and problems with our water quality and our, our water systems, but what is less known is that surface waters also play an important role in the, cl in the global climate. They store a lot of carbon, but they also emit a lot of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And this is also a focus of my research. So I'm talking a lot about life underwater, but how does that really look like? I mean, of course, this really depends on the type of water that we're uh, looking at. Um, so I would like to take you on a small expedition. We're going to dive into the water. So I would like to ask everybody to take a deep breath. And there we go. First, we start very nicely. We start in a very clear, transparent lake. We dive underwater, we open our eyes, and what do we see? We can see plants, maybe we see little zooplankton, we see some um, uh, small fishes uh, swimming, and when it's very transparent, we can even see the bottom. Now we're gonna make it a little bit less pleasant. I hope you're still with me. Let's take a deep breath again and we dive into a very turbid lake. This is a lake where a lot of nutrients uh, are, end up, and algae really like these nutrients, so they really start to grow. Uh, it becomes very green, and they absorb all the light. So if we go down and we open our eyes, we don't see a lot. It's very dark, and that's also why we hardly see any water plants, because the water plants also have a lack of light. Now, Ultimately, I'm going to take you to an even less nice place to swim, but I mean, we have to do it. We dive into a very sheltered place where there's not a lot of wind action, so there are not a lot of waves, and there are also a lot of nutrients. And this is a place where floating plants thrive. And here we see two pictures. For aquatic ecosystems, it's kind of difficult to tolerate with these uh, floating plants, but also to work there, as you can see here, is kind of a challenge if you want to go through it with your boat. These floating plants, they really profit from uh, climate warming the most because they're on top of the water column. So when it warms up, they are the first ones to profit. So that's why you also see a lot of floating plants in tropical countries. But as you all know, also in our ditches, we can have a full coverage with duckweed, crows, as you can see on the picture here. So this is the last dive we're gonna take. 
we dive into this system and of course this all sticks into our hair when we go down it's pitch black we don't see anything and that's because the plants they block all the light so it's very dark no or hardly any other water plants can uh, live here and that's why there's also no oxygen production there's no primary production in this water column so there's almost no oxygen present and if we touch the bottom which is of course very hard to prevent in ditches like this bubbles rise up from the sediment and some of these bubbles smell really bad uh, but not all the gases that come out uh, smell and two of those are very important greenhouse gases methane and co2 and that's also where i do a lot of my research in. So what I'm interested in uh, and, and what I have just uh, told you is that climate change hence impacts the plants that we find. Um, together with different type of other stressors, we find that climate change really profits floating plants and also algae. And this very often goes at the expense of uh, water plants that grow in the water column because they're outcompeted. Um, they don't have enough light um, to grow. And that's what I show in this picture also here. So what we have also seen is that these surface waters, they emit uh, greenhouse gases, very often in the form of bubbles, as we see here in this small uh, video. It looks really like a bubble bath. You know, there are a lot of bubbles coming up. And in this particular case, it's also because we came there by boat. So there's kind of disturbance of the sediment. But these bubbles, they also come up uh, naturally uh, and in a little bit I will tell you how this methane production um, um, takes place but what is what is interesting for us as researchers often when we arrive to a place like this we think oh this is really a hot spot we want to measure and see what comes out here but by the time that we have grabbed our gear to measure really these fluxes very often the bubbles are already all released and we are too late because it takes time for these bubbles to build up in the sediment again and to come out. And this also points out that it's really important how you measure things, because really the moment that you measure really impact a lot uh, the estimate of the methane emission that you would uh, estimate. So you can only tackle this by long-term measurements to really have a good estimate of what is coming out. So what we have found in our research uh, combining experiments with a global survey of all data available on methane emissions uh, correlated with temperature is that for each degree of warming the methane emissions from our surface waters increases with 6 uh, to 20 percent and that is really a lot because <coughs> roughly 30 percent of uh, global warming um, in our, uh, on our planet is caused by methane and a lot of this methane is emitted by water systems. So if our climate gets warmer, we even get more methane being emitted. And methane is a very strong greenhouse gas, much stronger than CO2, for instance. The good side is that it also breaks down very quickly in the atmosphere. So if we can do something about this methane emission, we also have a more faster way of tackling uh, climate change. So now I want to take you into a little class of how this methane is being formed. Methane is being formed by microorganisms that particularly thrive under conditions where there's not a lot of oxygen, but a lot of organic matter um, present. And water, the bottom of water systems are exactly places that fulfill these requirements because water systems accumulate a lot of organic matter, on the one hand because of dying algae or dying plants, but they also accumulate a lot of terrestrial matter like leaves and branches, and this all sinks to the bottom. And if there is a little bit of oxygen present, this will be very rapidly consumed by rotting processes that take place there. If you find any oxygen at all in a, in a, on the bottom of a water system, it would only be the very thin upper layer where some oxygen can penetrate. Well, methane 
dissolves very badly in water. And that's why it forms bubbles in the sediment. And when these bubbles are large enough and their buoyancy uh, increases, they can rise up to the, to the atmosphere and pass the water column and then end up uh, in the air above. Luckily for us, there are also other microbes that consume methane. So they're the methane consuming microbes. And here I depicted them as these uh, green rockets. They live in an oxic layer. They work best when there is oxygen present. So they can live on top of the sediment and really form a filter that consumes a lot of the methane that is being formed in the sediment. And by this, they prevent a lot of the methane that is being formed to be emitted to the, to the atmosphere. So this is a really important ecosystem service that we should cherish and that we should take care of. So this methane filter works best when there's a lot of oxygen in the water. Well, what we have seen, unfortunately, is that in some systems, like the one with the floating plants, there is very little oxygen present in the water column and hence also no present no oxygen present in the sediment. And these conditions are very good for the methane producing organisms, but very bad for the methane consuming organisms. So very often in these kind of systems, we see a lot of methane emission occurring. The methane filter can even be boosted, so it can work even better, not only if there is oxygen present in the water column, but if there is also oxygen pumped into the sediment. And some plants are able to do that by their roots. They produce oxygen and they leak oxygen into the sediment, thereby enhancing methane consumption taking place also in the sediment where otherwise that would not happen. So this is a very good uh, effect of these submerged plants that grow there. Now plants also impact uh, methane production and methane uh, transportation in other ways. So what some plants can do is that they uh, transport the methane through their roots, through their branches, through their leaves, to the atmosphere. And this especially happens when you have plants that reach out um, uh, into the air. For example, think of reed. They are really acting like chimneys that transport sed uh, methane from the sediment to the atmosphere and thereby this methane can bypass the methane filter that is laying on the, um, uh, on the sediment. So this is kind of a negative effect that plants could also have. So plants can impact this methane production and transportation in different ways, which also means that the overall effect of plants can vary between species and growth form. And this is something we are currently looking into this. Can we predict which plants have a beneficial effect and which don't? Well, we kind of have a hinge on that already. And what we have seen so far is that when we have plants that root and that leak this oxygen into the water, as I've just told you, there we find really much less methane emissions from these systems compared to systems that, have a very, that, that lack these kind of plants. We see this, for instance, when we compare different systems with these submerged plants and without these um, uh, submerged plants that instead have algae or floating plants. Unfortunately, what I just told you is that climate change tends to favor algae and floating plants at the expense of submerged plants. So this is really, this is really actually a, a sad message. Uh, because what we would like to have are these submerged plants because um, they emit less methane. And what's also what we have found is that when it warms up, we see in the, what I just told you, there is an increase in methane emission, but this is dampened when you have these water plants growing there. So if we have, if we manage, and this is the positive side, if we manage to restore or conserve these water plants, we not only um, have systems that emit less, but they're also more robust against climate change because the increase in greenhouse gas emissions that coincides with warming will be less when we have these plants compared to when we have algae or floating plants. 
So this also means that re re restoration has good points from water quality and biodiversity perspective and from water quality and, and from climate change perspective. So in this sense, it's a win-win situation. Well, we base these findings on a, on a lot of different types of research that we do. We do experiments in the greenhouse or sometimes even smaller in a laboratory. Uh, that we see in the left upper corner where we have aquaria where we can manipulate the temperature, we can manipulate the plants, we can manipulate the amount of nutrients that we get. But we, and this is in the, the greenhouse that we have at our university. And behind, that univer uh, behind this uh, greenhouse, we also have an experimental garden where we have a lot of mini lakes, let's say. And that is really our play garden, let's say. We can manipulate uh, also the, the plant species that we have there. We can measure all types of emissions. So these are all more experimental um, uh, studies that we do, but we also measure in natural environments outside. Sometimes with cages, as you see here, and this also shows that you have to really be fit as an aquatic ecologist to do this kind of uh, to do this kind of work. It's not a, it's not an everyday thing, I would say. So what we do is we look at the effects of different stressors on the water quality and the plants and the animals. Uh, and I have talked a lot about the effects of plants on these uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but we also look at other organisms like uh, fish and macrofauna. And one thing I haven't mentioned yet, but that is that the, our water systems of the future will very likely not only be warmer, but also more saline. A combination of sea level water rise and also an, an increased human consumption of fresh water combined with prolo prolonged periods of drought uh, will make that our are here in the Netherlands, but also worldwide, a lot of waters will become more saline in the future. And of course, this impacts water quality uh, uh, very strongly, including all the organisms that live there. It's an open question, however, still, how this will impact the greenhouse gas emissions from our inland waters. So several experiments hint at the fact that uh, greenhouse gas emissions from these more brackish systems will be less than from freshwater systems. And this has different underlying reasons. But it's, it's not yet known if this is also the case for the more nutrient-rich and more polluted waters um, that we have a lot, as we have seen in the, um, in the first European map that I showed you. So what we see here in this picture is a, is a very uh, long-running, more than six years running an uh, experiment in a nature reserve just above um, Amsterdam, led by our spin-off company, uh, Beware, where very meticulously we had a uh, different, um, uh, we had a salinity gradient that we followed over many years. So here in this nature reserve, we saw very clearly that the methane emissions were going down with, um, with salinity. But the question still is if this is a general pattern or not, and this is one of the things I would like to uh, look into in the future, is one of the future research lines. Well, our research is definitely curiosity driven. We really, l we are curious people and we like to know the answers to a lot of questions that we pose ourselves and also that a society uh, asks us. Uh, and I also think that our uh, research has a direct uh, societal relevance. And for one, a very obvious relevance here is through our education. So in courses such as uh, applied ecology, the bachelor course and management of ecosystems, uh, a master course, we teach our students kind of the cutting edge um, knowledge about aquatic ecology and um, biochemistry. I think I feel our mission is succeeded when a student, after finishing their uh, education with us, knows and is enthusiastic about protecting the nature um, around us. And I think in many cases we succeed in this, and this is really what makes me a happy person also at my 
at my work. I think the other relevant uh, issue that we have related to the type of work that we do is uh, based on um, our measurements of greenhouse gas emissions and trying to be able to tackle this. Based on our measurements, for instance, we estimate that six to or seven to 16 percent of the methane emissions from our national territory originates from ditches. <coughs> so this is still excluding all the lakes and the rivers that we also have. So this is really a lot. So that also means that if we manage to reduce this emission, we can really make a big impact on our national greenhouse gas emission budget. And this would then also reduce the footprint of, for example, milk and cheese that is produced in these ditch-rich areas that we see here. And this brings me to my other line of research, which is related to the production of, um, of wet food, let's call it that way. Because I really like to do research in pristine environments to go to beautiful places, to be in, in my boat, and to sample and to see all the beauty around me. But I think as a water biologists, we also have a role to play in the less beautiful places, uh, as we see here, for example. And these are examples of fish ponds, of aquaculture. There are a lot of these fish ponds in the world and the, their number is, um, is still growing, which goes hand in hand with the expansion of the human population and the coinciding uh, demand for uh, human food and proteins. And this combined with the fact that the uh, livestock of fishes is decreasing, we are more and more relying on cultured fish. Very little is still known about the impacts of these agricultural uh, systems, and that's what we are currently studying. So what you see here on this picture is one of our research sites in, um, in Brazil, where we have, um, and I say we, obviously, we have been doing a lot of work in estimating uh, different things. So there's, as I already said, there is very little known about the greenhouse gas emissions from these fish ponds, and hence uh, also the footprint that was associated with this cultured fish was also always very optimistic because until three to four years ago the footprint of these cultured fish was mostly based on the production of the feed, the transport of the feed and the transport of the fish and the energy consumption at the farm. So think about energy for example of aeration of the ponds. And there was no attention being given to the greenhouse gas emissions from the ponds directly. So that's what we set off doing. Uh, and we aimed to measure all kinds of emissions. So the diffusive emissions, the bubble emissions that I already uh, mentioned before, which also take place in these kind of ponds, but also, which was very often overlooked, the emissions from the dry ponds, because very often these ponds are drained when they harvest the fish and then they are cleaned so they stay dry for, uh, for quite a while and these are hot moments for N2O emission. And N2O, I haven't mentioned that before, but is also an even stronger greenhouse gas than methane. So we're all taking this into consideration. And the next step, of course, will be to compare the different systems that we find there in the field. So they have different management techniques, they culture different species. Um, and our, our aim is to get more insight in what is driving the emissions from these different ponds. Obviously to eventually help to develop management techniques that can reduce the emission. So we don't have the answer yet of how to do that. Um, but we are making nice progress, I would say. We, and I particularly want to mention also Natan Barros, which is the Brazilian PI uh, in, this, uh, in this project, we focus mostly on sustainability from an environmental perspective. But we realize that this is not the only thing. Uh, we work together with animal physiologists and also social scientists um, to look at the more general picture 
because obviously we also would like to improve the livelihood of the people that are depending on this uh, fish culturing. So I think it can go hand in hand to improve their livelihoods and also to decrease their environmental impact. I really don't think we can uh, achieve one without the other. So when we look at the footprint of these cultured fish, as I already told you before, it was kind of optimistic, the greenhouse gas footprint that was associated with the cultured fish. Until some years ago, it was considered to be more uh, environmental friendly than uh, pork, for instance, and way more environmental friendly than beef, because I hope you all know that eating beef is very bad for the environment. And I didn't put it here, but the vegetarian diet is, of course, even better from this perspective. So we had a very optimistic view of the carbon footprint of cultured fish. Then when we add the emissions of the ponds that we have now measured, of course, the footprint increases. So it will be a little bit similar or a little bit higher than the pork meat. What we have seen so far, too, is that some ponds, however, have very high emissions. Um, and the next, so, so these, then, and of course then associated with that is also a very high footprint of this cultured fish. And this is really very variable. So the next step, we want to relate this to the management techniques and to see <laughs> if, we can, um, if we can reduce this footprint. And I think what we so far see that there are different options that are very much related to fine-tuning the, the feeding of the fish. So what kind of feed you give them, how often do you feed them, at what time of the day. And here we see a very um, large pond that is being uh, fed from a, a tractor. Um, and so optimizing the feeding and the management of the sediment on the bottom. So if there is a lot of sediment, there are a lot of bubbles and there is very high emissions. If you could remove the sediment or reduce the accumulation of sediment in these systems, you would have really some handles to tackle the emissions from these ponds. So I'm going very fast. I think in the conclusions, uh, I can say that the water, um, that our aquatic ecosystems are in hot water. That's how I started, and I think it's really uh, the case here. So we have several problems. Nutrient pollution is a very strong one. Drought and warming all lead to a very bad water quality. Happily, I also see, and I hope in this talk I'm able to convince you, that there is also a momentum to change this from different perspectives. And one is the ecological perspective. So what we see in general, overall in our work, is that when we improve the ecological um, status, the uh, ecological conditions of our water systems, by reducing other stressors, particularly also uh, excessive nutrient loading, then we will have a better water quality. And we will also reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So this is really a win-win situation. So this already, I think we already should be motivated to in, uh, improve our water quality, but this would even double the motivation to do so. And the other one is from a sustainability perspective. As I show you, showed you, green, uh, there is a lot of emission occurring from uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and we can also make very big steps to reduce these emissions on a landscape scale and even larger. Think about the picture that I showed you with the ditches. If we, uh, if we manage to reduce the emissions there, we can really make big steps. And lastly, I think we can also make big steps in reducing the emissions from uh, the production of feed um, that, is, uh, that is cultured under wet conditions. I haven't mentioned rice which is obviously also a very uh, important um, uh, wet production method and the aquaculture that we have just discussed. 
Well, I don't know if you counted, but if you did, during my talk, you have heard me say more or less 38 times we and seven times I. And that is because what I have shown you is not my work alone. This is really a team um, effort. Um, without the technical support of uh, the technicians of our department, but also from the general instrumentation, and also from our techno center, me and my fellow collaborators would never be able to do the type of work we do. We are at the forefront of greenhouse gas emission measurements and research in aquatic systems and in wetland systems because we have very innovative methods to measure these things. And I would really like to thank all the collaborators for this. So here in the, this movie, you see a, a recently developed uh, automatic measuring chamber. Maybe it looks simple from the outside. It goes up and down, but it has a lot of high-tech equipment inside. Uh, and you can leave it standalone, and it will measure all kinds of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. It even goes further. Uh, in collaboration with uh, Trace Detection Lab, also from the Radboud University, um, a laser has been developed that can measure all kinds of gases, including greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And it comes with a very accurate um, quantification of these uh, gases uh, between two points. And here you see it working in a um, wastewater treatment plant um, where they are measuring particularly greenhouse gases. So this really works well and it's also a very nice uh, way of working together with people that have completely other um, skills than, uh, than we have. And this brings me to the, to the thank you already. And here I need my notes because I don't want to forget anything here. Let me see because these collaborations that I just mentioned, so the ones with the technicians and the colleagues, um, make that we have a very nice collaborative and also fun department. So this was until the 1st of January, the Department of uh, Aquatic Ecology and Environmental Biology. And since the 1st uh, of January, it's the, um, um, ecology, the Department of Ecology. And not everybody is on the picture, but make sure that I thought of everybody uh, when putting this. And the atmosphere and the collaborative nature really makes that I go, that I bike to work whistling. I really enjoy working with all of you, and um, thank you for that. And within these things, I would also like to thank the colleagues of and the financial department, the Radboud Innovation and the International Office, because there are a lot of people behind the scenes that you don't see so often, and they also make our work really possible. The PhD candidates, of course, the current and the former, as well as all the students. And then to the other part, I would like to thank the dean, um, Cybrand de Jong and also Mark, Mark Huibrechts and Leon as our former head of department because the three of you were vital in making me taking the last step to become a full professor. So thank you for that. And also Jan um, and Fons, I know he's, uh, he's in Bolivia at the moment. He's, uh, he's watching online. I would like to thank you for being supportive and very uh, motivating from the very first moment that I started working in Nijmegen. I really remember, Jan, when you gave me the waders the first time I came into the office and I thought, wow, that is very nice. We're going to dive into the deep right away. To come to Nijmegen, I had to leave the warm nest of Wageningen, which was also a very special place for me to be. The time at Aquatic Ecology and Water Quality Management Group in Wageningen was very special to me and not in the least because we set out to sample 100 lakes in South America on a latitudinal gradient. 
together with my uh, PhD sister, Shisa Lasserot, who is in uh, Antarctica at the moment, also watching online. She was trying at least. Um, we set out for two years to sample these lakes. Um, in Brazil, Uruguay and Argentina. And I don't know where to start to express my gratitude for this very nice team that we uh, had here. Um, the entire team, and especially the mentors, Martin, Erik Jeppesen, and Egwit. I saw you, ah, there you are. And my scientific mother, Vera Husar, which is also on the picture here, and I know she's watching online. Their doors, their emails, and also their hearts were always open. And I learned so much from you all. I have beautiful memories of that adventurous expedition, and it led to many new friendships and long-standing collaborations in Uruguay and in Brazil. Um, quisiera agradecer mucho a mis compañeros uruguayos y mis compañeras uruguayas y mis colaboradores y amigos brasileños. Sem seus conhecimentos, sabedoria de vida, humor, música, comida y bebida, meu currículo, mais, mais importante, minha vida, seria muito diferente. Trabalhamos juntos para melhorar o mesmo planeta e isso me faz sentir que o nosso trabalho é importante e vale a pena. Obrigada e graças. I could easily fill my 45 minutes with talking about all the precious people, colleagues, national and international collaborations of current and past projects. And please know that when preparing this talk, everybody passed through my heart and through my head. Special thanks also to the um, colleagues of our spin-off company, Beware. I saw several people already sitting here. Working with you has truly enriched my view on nature management in the Netherlands and abroad. And now I will switch to Dutch. Want graag ga ik nog iets verder terug in mijn dankwoord. En wil ik ook de docenten aan de Hogeschool Zeeland en mijn middelbare school Scheldemond en Vlissingen bedanken. Daar heb ik een hele goede basis kunnen leggen. En ik wens alle kinderen dezelfde gedreven onderwijzers als ik heb gehad. En met de enorme lesuitval en de docenten tekorten is dat helaas zeker geen gegeven meer. Ja, want de reizen heeft mijn leven verrijkt. Dat leven dat begon in Bresjes, een dorp in Zeeland. Dat ik nooit dacht te verlaten. Veel familie op loopafstand, beide opa's werkzaam in de watersector. Eén visser, één in de waterleidingbedrijf. Maar vooral ook omringd door heel veel sterke vrouwen. Twee oma's. Een opo. En supertantes. En nu ga ik even verder. Ik denk aan jullie allemaal. En thuis deden we al aan... Actief biologisch beheer. Daar is het allemaal begonnen. In dit vijvertje. Samen met mijn zus Annabel en mijn vader gingen we uh, watervlooien vangen om het water helder te maken. Vervolgens gooiden we de stekelbaasjes in 
Die aten we al watervlooien op, dus die moesten er weer uit. En dan gooiden we er weer kikkers in. En is één. En we hebben er toch heel veel van opgestoken. Een heerlijke plek om op te groeien. En zo dacht ik dus ook om nooit meer weg te gaan. Heel fijn maar dat jij ons de wijde wereld in heeft, hebt gestuurd. En dat stimuleerde. Annabel had het iets sterker door dan ik. En pas later realiseerde ik me hoe fijn het is om goede thuisbasis te hebben en zo de wereld in te trekken, zodat je heel makkelijk ook altijd weer terugkomt. Dat geeft zo'n goed gevoel. Ik heb echt de halve familie meegesleurd op veldwerk. Mijn nicht Roda kwam me na in Ecuador om daar veldwerk met mij te doen. Oké, okay, de Galapagos was misschien ook leuk. Pa en ma. Jullie zijn ons en mij overal achterna gereisd. Eerst naar Costa Rica, toen naar Ecuador, later naar Brazilië. Waar ma alle apparatuur heeft schoongemaakt en weer georganiseerd. Ik weet nog dat Giselle zei van ik ben met het ver ver verkeerde familielid op expeditie gegaan. En pa, jij hebt daar alle netten uh, weer dichtgebreid die kapot waren gemaakt door de, uh, door de vissen. Jeroen. Toen kwam jij terug in mijn leven en trokken we er samen op uit. Na een poosje kwam ook Linde ons leven verrijken. En vond je het geen probleem om achterna te reizen naar Brazilië, waar ik aan het werk was. Je vond het eerst geen probleem, maar het bleek toch een behoorlijke uitdaging te zijn. Uh, Ewout, met jou was ons gezin compleet. Jij en Linde hebben jullie eigen interesses. Maar ik ben blij dat jullie soms na enige stimulans je ook laten enthousiasmeren om mee te gaan op veldwerk. Eerst gingen we de Gelderse beekjes af en deze zomer nog zijn we de Zeeuwse sloten ingedoken. Jeroen, jij staat altijd klaar aan het thuisfront. Altijd scherp om kritisch naar dingen te kijken en het van een andere kant te belichten. En dat is super fijn, zeker nu met de management taken. Er allerlei andere dingen op me afkomen. Mijn liefde en dank aan jou en aan de kinderen en jullie, pa en ma en ook Annabel en Jennifer, zijn niet in woorden uit te drukken en zonder jullie zou ik hier nu niet staan. Ik heb gesproken. Professor Korsten, thank you very much for this inaugural lecture. Um, I think it went well beyond uh, what I expected from the title. You did not only talk about uh, the temperature effect on surface water, but on many other effects. Uh, salinity, uh, one of them. Um, but also on, on um, ways to mitigate uh, the things that you studied and found to have a negative impact on, for example, climate. And I really admire the way you connect your fundamental scientific um, research with the application to make a, a better world. And uh, uh, we at Radboud University very much like this kind of impact, both on the scientific front and on the, uh, on, on the front of making a better world. Um, You already mentioned teamwork, which is, uh, of course, uh, uh, very important in your field of work. Um, and you also mentioned already the introduction of uh, um, um, involving social studies in, uh, in some of your projects. And uh, the thing that um, sort of kept me busy during all of your lecture was how do we scale this up? And um, there, of course, uh, the, the impact of social sciences will be uh, probably necessary to, to include with your, all your type of practical solutions the acceptance in the world to actually really apply them. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, I found this very stimulating that you already made that connection. Thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, on a personal note, I, I very much <laughs> like you that you accepted 
to be a full professor among us. I think uh, you will do a, a wonderful job. Thank you. Um, this uh, brings us uh, more or less to the end of this ceremony. Um, at, the, at the very end, um, we will leave the, the room in, the, in cortege. Um, first, the, uh, the uh, new professor, uh, followed by the other professors, the older professors. Um, and then uh, the, the, the rest of you uh, will follow. Uh, I uh, got it that uh, we will have a picture on the, on the stairs. For all the others, please wait on, on top of the stairs. Um, it, it may be dangerous, actually, to, to loiter around uh, on, on, the, on the stairs. Um, and then we will have uh, some uh, drinks and bites in the foyer, which is uh, uh, below the, the, the staircase. That concludes the, uh, this ceremony, but not before we say some traditional words at this university, which I would like to invite you all to rise. Gratias tibi agimus omnipotens Deus pro omnibus beneficius tuis, vivis et regnas per omnia secula seculorum.